If you have your Bibles with you, please, uh, this evening, turn with me to the book of Genesis in the chapter 34. Genesis chapter 34. I'd like to thank Roy for leading tonight, and a special thank you to Alistair for coming along and sharing a word of testimony this evening. We really do appreciate it very much indeed. Genesis chapter 34, and we'll begin at the first verse. And Dina, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her, he lay with her, and he defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel, and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field where they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her him to wife. And make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you, and ye shall dwell with us. And the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and get you possessions therein. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me, but give me this damsel to wife. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father deceitfully and said, Because he had defiled Dinah their sister. And they said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this will we consent unto you, if ye will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if ye will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter, and we will be gone. And their words pleased Hammer and Shechem, Hammer's son. And the young man deferred not to do the thing, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter, and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. And Hammer and Shechem, his son, came unto the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us. Therefore let them dwell in the land and trade therein. For the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us to be one people, if every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. And unto Hammer and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city. And every male was circumcised all that went out of the gate of the city. And it came to pass on the third day, when they were sure that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they slew Hammer and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dina out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field. And all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to take me or to, to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. We'll end the reading there, and we'll just bow in a word of prayer and seek the Lord's help. Father, we thank you uh, for your presence already with us in the meeting tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the reminder of what you can do in a life that is completely yielded unto thee. We thank you, Lord, that salvation is completely of the Lord tonight. 
There's nothing we can do to earn it or, or deserve it. But we thank you, Lord, tonight that you're in our presence and you're willing to save those that will repent and put their faith in the Bless Alistair and Heather and their family in the days that lie ahead. And we pray now, Lord, that you will just speak to each individual in this meeting tonight and meet us all at the point of our need. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may recall that Esau was planning on killing his brother Jacob just as soon as his father would pass away because Jacob had cheated him out of his father's blessing. His mother Rebekah heard of the plan and persuaded her husband Isaac to send Jacob to Paddan Aram where Rebekah's brother Laban was living. As far as we know, Isaac knew absolutely nothing of this assassination plot on Jacob. And as far as Isaac was concerned, he was only sending Jacob to get a wife from one of Laban's daughters. Just one wife, which has always been God's plan for one man. From creation, we know that Adam had only the one wife, and here Isaac had only the one wife, which makes him actually unique among the patriarchs. And he wanted Jacob only to have one wife as well. And to be fair, that was what Jacob had planned when he fell in love with Rachel. But you know, when we're far from home and fall into the wrong company, unexpected and sometimes bad things can happen. As many young Christians prepare and begin university and stay in halls and other forms of accommodation and they make new friends and are far away from home, they must make sure that they're not far away from God. Because when we're far from home and far from God, unexpected and sometimes bad things can happen. Jacob arranged with Laban to work seven years for Rachel's hand in marriage. She is described as being beautiful and well-favored. It probably was love at first sight. He was head over heels in love. All he could think about from morning to night was beautiful Rachel. But when the big day arrived, the man who had once tricked his father into giving him a blessing instead of his brother Esau, he was the one that was now tricked by his father-in-law into marrying the wrong daughter. It is an inescapable law of life that we eventually reap what we sow. God in his grace will forgive our sins when we repent of our sins, but God in his government just sometimes stands back and allows us to suffer the painful consequences of our sins. I don't know about you, but the first thing that would enter my mind when I think about this situation would be, I mean, how could Jacob have been so stupid? How could he possibly marry the wrong woman? Well, we can't be sure, of course, but perhaps the combination of a darkened bridal chamber and maybe a little too much wine to drink had led to this huge blunder on Jacob's part. But it was a master stroke by his devious father-in-law. Laban would eventually marry off two daughters to this wealthy Jacob, and he had also secured another seven years' service from his son-in-law as a bonus. So after another seven years, Jacob eventually gets to marry his sweetheart. Laban must have congratulated himself on such a successful scheme, not realizing that the Lord was ruling and overruling in the entire event. The Proverbs reminds us that there is no wisdom nor understanding nor counsel against the Lord. You see, there's nothing that we can do will jeopardize the plans of Almighty God. He laughs at man's rebellion. Satan certainly puts his men at the top of government, whether it's in Ireland at the moment or over in Canada at the moment, and he puts them there to push his agenda. But these men are only fulfilling God's end time prophecy. As Jacob's son Joseph would say many years later, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Christians would even say today with Paul, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Eventually, God told Jacob to arise and go home. So when Laban was out in the field shearing his sheep, Jacob takes the opportunity to escape with all his wealth and all his family, which included by now his two wives, his two concubines, his 11 sons, and his daughter. Along the way, Laban catches up with them, but they make peace. Also along the way, he meets his brother Esau, but again, the two men are now reconciled. So things seem to be going pretty well for Jacob. Esau then returns to Seir, and Jacob settles in Succoth, where he builds a house and some, some sheds for his cattle. 
Perhaps maybe 10 years later, Jacob travels on to the city of Shalem and he pitches his tent before the city. Now, the last time we read of a man who pitches his tent before a city was when Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. And we all know how that turned out. And unfortunately, it wasn't going to fare much better here for Jacob. God's original plan was for Jacob to return to Bethel and then to his home in Hebron where his father Isaac was still living. But Jacob was tarrying and delaying. We might say that he was dilly-dallying or messing about. First in Succoth, and then he bought some ground just outside this city of Shalem. He was beginning to get much too comfortable. He was supposed to be on a journey. He was supposed to be a pilgrim just passing through. But Jacob had settled down, and he was in no hurry to obey the Lord. Perhaps we could say a lot like the church today. We're supposed to be mere pilgrims just passing through and we've been given orders to complete something to occupy our time as we move towards eternity. We have all got a mission to accomplish, yet we have become much too comfortable in our beautiful church buildings and our so-called service for God has become nothing more than an endless cycle of meetings. Yes, Jacob was taking a stand among the ungodly. Yes, he was not ashamed to own his Lord or to defend his cause. And in fact, chapter 33 here in verse 34, it says that he built an altar to establish a public witness. But sacrifice is no substitute for obedience. Coming to church, staying for communion, paying into that church is no substitute for obedience. We cannot bargain or do deals with God and give him less than he requires. And as far as our salvation is concerned, God requires everything. It's all or nothing. God gave his life for us so that we could give our lives to him. And if we don't, there will be consequences. And as this story unfolds here, we see clearly that there were consequences to Jacob's disobedience. You see, there is a danger in delaying. And first of all, we read here that there was a rape, a rape. When we disobey the Lord, we're actually putting our family in great danger. Little Dina was Jacob's only daughter, and no doubt the apple of his eye. Jacob had 12 sons. He had only the one daughter, and he thought the world of her. She would have been able to wrap her daddy around her little finger get him to cave in at our every request. There's no doubt in my mind about it. I'm speaking from experience. She was probably no more than 14 or 15 at the time. Dina may have been pestering her daddy about going out with the other Canaanite girls until he eventually gave in. She may have been naive. She may have been curious. She may have been even rebellious. Yes, there were rebellious teenagers even back in biblical times. But maybe she was just ignorant of the traps that the devil can set for young people. Whatever it was, that day was going to change her life forever. Verse 1 says that she went out to see the daughters of the land, probably a dance or some sort of party. Having no one of her own age and gender at home, she was probably bored. You know, teenagers can get bored and often they seek the cure for their boredom in the wrong way. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Paul said that those who waste their time in idleness are very easily led into sin. He told the Thessalonians that we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Idle, of course, it means lazy or doing nothing when you should be doing something. And often it stems from not having a specific purpose or goal in mind. With no goal, we can be easily distracted. We live in a sinful world, and a person who doesn't have something to do will be tempted to do something sinful. If we have nothing to do, the devil is always too eager to find things to occupy our time. Jesus told us to pray for workers to be sent into the harvest field, not idlers. Idlers are no use to God. There is work to be done for the kingdom. Souls are perishing and we must not be distracted by the things of the world or even waste our precious years on the entertainments of the world. Dina had become lured away into the world. Now, of course, 
we have to go into the world to serve God. That's what we're told to do. That's what the, the Great Commission is all about. But Dina didn't go out that day to give out tracts. Verse 1 says she went out to see. But the problem is she had also been seen. It's bad enough for our young people to, be, to see sin. But ten times worse for sin to see and take notice of our young people. And that's why it's so important for young Christian ladies to dress appropriately. There's more important things to cover than our heads. Shechem, who was some sort of prince in the land, but also a slave to his own lust, he seduced little Dina. He took her and he raped her. She was just a vulnerable girl. He took advantage of that and of his own position. Prince or no prince, he had no right. I mean, who did he think he was? He had defiled Dina and he had sinned against God and he was going to pay. Thank God tonight that sinners pay. Where would we be in Northern Ireland tonight as we look back at 40 years of violence if we thought that sin was going to go unpunished? Thank God it's going to be punished. But secondly, we see here the request. After the deed was done, Shechem kept Dina hidden in his own home. He had kidnapped her. It seems, however, that his lust had turned to love, and he even treated Dina very well after the initial crime. Verse 19 actually says that he was more honorable than all the others. This is in stark contrast to when Amnon raped his half-sister Tamar. His lust had turned to hatred, and he literally threw her out of the bedroom. But Shechem wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to put the wrong right. But doing a very good deed after doing a very bad deed will not erase the sin. Doing good things is what we should be doing anyway, all of the time. And no amount of good deeds will ever erase the sin in our lives. Even if we could live a whole day without sinning, which is impossible, but even if we could, it still leaves thousands upon thousands of other days full of sins which are still on our account. That's why the Bible says that salvation is not of works. It can't be. It's impossible. Shechem's sin of rape, which in our culture is pedophilia as well, because Dina obviously was under the, the age of consent. It was pedophilia. That is, of course, until they get round to changing that law as well, and the way things are going probably won't be very long. But Shechem's sin, it had to be punished. And our sin, whatever it might be, must also be punished. The trouble was Shechem and all the other Canaanites were pagans. They had no concept of right and wrong. They knew nothing of a God who was merciful, but also of a God who was altogether just and who would punish sin. Unfortunately, we live in a society that knows not God today and even denies his existence. They form their own gods to suit their own lifestyle and their own agenda. But it doesn't change the fact that there is a God in heaven who is a God and the author of this Bible who demands justice. And his justice demands punishment. And God's punishment will take place in the lake of fire forever. The doctrine of eternal punishment is an issue that bothers many people, even some Christians who have an incomplete understanding of three things, the nature of God, the nature of man, and the nature of sin. As fallen, sinful human beings, the nature of God is a difficult concept for the best of us to grasp. We tend to see God as a kind, merciful being whose love for us overrides and overshadows all of his other attributes. Of course, God is loving, God is kind, God is merciful, but he is first and foremost a holy and a righteous God, so holy that he cannot tolerate our sin. He is a God whose anger burns against the wicked and the disobedient. He is not only a loving God, he is love itself. But the Bible also tells us that he hates all manner of sin. And while he is merciful, there are limits to his mercy. Humanity is corrupted by sin. You will know that in Genesis, sodomites only came out at night. But nowadays they come out in broad daylight and parade our streets. 
But whatever sin it is, it's always directed against God. When David sinned by committing adultery with Bathsheba and having Uriah murdered, he responded with a very interesting prayer. He said, God, against you and you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight. You see, David understood that all sin is ultimately against God. God is an eternal and infinite being. And as a result, all our sin requires an eternal punishment. God's holy, perfect, and infinite character has been offended by our sin. Although to our finite minds, our sin is limited in time to God who is outside of time, the sin that we commit and that he hates goes on and on and on and on. Our sin is eternally before him and must be eternally punished in order to satisfy his holy justice. No one understands this better than someone that is presently languishing in hell. And a perfect example of that is the rich man and Lazarus. Both died. The rich man went to hell and Lazarus went to paradise. The rich man was aware that his sins were only committed during his lifetime on earth. But interestingly, the rich man never says, how did I end up here? That question never, ever enters his mind. He doesn't even say to God, you know, God, do I really deserve this? Don't you think, God, this is just a little bit extreme, a little bit over the top? No. He understood why he was being punished. He only asked that someone be sent back to earth to his brothers to warn them, to warn them of this place. And tonight we're being warned. Like the rich man, every sinner in hell has a full realization that he deserves to be there. Each sinner has a fully informed, acutely aware, and sensitive conscience, which in hell becomes his own personal tormentor forever. The rich man knew that eternal punishment for a lifetime of sins is justified and fully deserved. That is why he never protested. He never questioned being in hell. The realities of eternal damnation, eternal hell, eternal punishment are frightening and disturbing. But it is good that we might indeed be terrified because whilst this is the grim reality, there is wonderful news tonight. God loves us and God wants to save us from hell. But because God is also just and righteous, he cannot allow our sin to go unpunished. Someone has to pay the price. And in his great mercy and love, God provided his own payment for our sin. He sent his precious son, the Lord Jesus, to pay the penalty for our sins by dying on that cross in Calvary. Jesus' death was an infinite death because he is the infinite God-man, paying our infinite sin debt so that we would not have to pay it in hell for all eternity. If we confess our sin, if we place our faith in Christ, asking for God's forgiveness based on Christ's sacrifice, we shall be saved, forgiven, cleansed, and promised an eternal home in heaven. And there's no better news than that. God loved us so much that he provided the means for our salvation. But if we reject his gift of eternal life, we will face the eternal consequences of that decision. But here Prince Shechem or the Canaanites, they knew nothing of the punishment or indeed the mercy of God. Proverbs says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. You see, Shechem attempted to put the wrong right. His way, verse four, was to send his father to Jacob as a mediator to do the deal, but it would end in death. I wonder if there, is there someone here tonight and you've been trying to, all your life to put the wrong right by your methods and by your ways. Well, my friend, it's going to end in death. Hammer ends up negotiating with the whole of Jacob's family. Shechem will have Dina on any terms. He is so in love with her. Hammer explains the advantages of such a wonderful union. They can dwell and do business together, and Israel's sons can marry Canaanite daughters. 
It all sounds so wonderful. But the weasel words from false teachers also sound so wonderful. But it doesn't change a thing. Because there's only one way. If it had been left perhaps to the two fathers, maybe a more peaceful outcome would have taken place. But Jacob's sons had now become the chief negotiators. And in verse 13, things took a more sinister twist. And thirdly, we see here the requirement. In order for the deal to be done, the sons of Jacob required that the Canaanites be circumcised and become like them. But it would take more than circumcision to make, to make Canaanites into Jews. And in the same way, it takes more than observing ordinances or sacraments to make sinners into Christians and to turn children of the devil into children of God. Jesus hit the nail on the head when he said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. There must be a turning away from sin and a turning towards the Savior. Everyone who wants to get to heaven must enter through the straight gate and walk along the narrow way. No man can be born again by his own efforts. It is a supernatural one-time event, a miracle that only God can perform. When Jacob's sons were told of what happened, their little sister, they were naturally grieved at that sin and angry at this pervert prince, and rightly so. But instead of declaring outright war, they pretend to seek a peaceful outcome with their neighbors. It appears they want to strike a deal, do business together and intermarry, and all the men of Shalem had to do was agree to be circumcised. The Canaanites also saw this as an opportunity to absorb Israel, gradually possess their wealth and their people. But the real deception was on the part of Jacob's sons. They used this surgery of circumcision as a means to greatly weaken the men, of, and, and the Canaanites never suspected the danger that they were in. Most of Dungannon, you know, and the Moy area, they do not suspect the danger they're in. In spite of all the opportunities that have been given, in spite of the open airs at the top of the town, in spite of the services in the park during the summer, in spite of all the endless invitations in the Tyrone Quarry to come in under the word, and soon it will be too late. Finally, we see here the revenge. At a time when the males of Shalem were in the recovery stage and in too much pain to put up a fight and defend themselves. Simeon and Levi, two of Dina's full brothers, they rallied some men within Jacob's camp and the attack. There was no mercy shown. They killed Hammer and Shechem and all the males of the city. Then they looted the city and took captive the women and the children, and they managed even to rescue their sister. It was a well-planned operation, which was a complete success. Shechem had tried to atone for his own sin that day, but he had paid with his own blood. And if you're here tonight and all your life you've been trying to atone for your own sin, this is how it's going to end up. The Bible tells us that it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse us from every sin. It was a wicked thing to do. And when news came through to Jacob, he was both angry and indeed frightened. For many years, Jacob had lived in peace. He had taken up a sickle and farmed, but now his sons had taken up a sword and killed. Their actions had ruined Jacob's testimony among the heathen. How could they be representatives now of a God of love and mercy and compassion when they would always be remembered as a people of slaughter, blood, pain, and death? You see, our actions will often speak louder than our words. If we cannot live like Christians, then there's very little point in speaking like Christians. James says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Simeon and Levi's actions did not display the faith of a believer. Faith without works is dead faith because the lack of works reveals an unchanged life for a spiritually dead heart. True saving faith will result in a transformed life. How we live reveals what we truly believe. James is not saying that our works make us righteous before God, but that real saving faith is demonstrated by good works. Works are not the cause of salvation, 
but works are the evidence of our salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ has simply a false or dead faith and is not saved. Many profess to be Christians, but their lives and their priorities tell a different story. Jesus Jesus put it simply by saying, you will know them by their fruits. The message of Jesus is the same as the message of James. Obedience to God is the mark of true saving faith. Faith without works is dead because it reveals a heart that has not been transformed by God. When we have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, our lives will demonstrate that new life within us. Paul said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Jacob's testimony was ruined that day before the people of the land. What was the point in building an altar to worship the one and true God before his pagan neighbors if his sons were going to act like pagans? You see, there is no point in putting on a suit and a tie and even wearing a head covering for an hour on Sunday morning if we're going to be a pagan in business the rest of the week. What's the point? Who are we trying to kid? This was the danger of being sluggish in obedience. Jacob's daughter had been raped. His sons had become murderers. If only he had obeyed God at the start and went to Bethel, this never, ever would have happened. Perhaps there's someone here tonight, and you've heard the gospel call, and you know what God requires you to do, and you have even decided in your heart that this is what you will do someday in the future. But like Jacob, you're dilly-dallying in that decision. Oh, yes, you intend to get there someday, but you're still knocking around with the world in Shalem. You're still sitting on the fence. You're neither hot nor cold. You're still halting between two opinions. But as we have seen tonight, there is a danger in delay. Not only for you, but for your sons and for your daughters. Why should your family stay out of the world? when you're still flirting with the world yourself. Jacob found out the hard way. It is a warning to us all who are sitting on the fence tonight not to find out the hard way. God is calling each of us today to come on to him. Now is the accepted time, and now is the day of salvation. Don't wait, folks, until it's too late. There is a danger in delay, and the consequences will be disastrous. But there is good news tonight. We know what it is. We just need to finally accept it, take it, own it, live it, embrace it, experience that abundant life that God has for you and wants to offer you even the same. We'll pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you, Lord, that you're a merciful God. But we thank you for the reminder that there is limits to your mercy. You're a long-suffering God, but eventually, eventually your patience will run out. And there is a great danger in delay. And Father, we pray if there's anyone in our meeting tonight that perhaps has the best of intentions to get right with you someday. Lord, let them realize that that day may never come. There's a danger in delay. We thank you, Lord, that now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. As we've been reminded even during the week, death can come at any age. No one is guaranteed to live a long and happy and prosperous life. And it's so important that we're ready today. Thank you, Father, that you're a God of justice. And we can rejoice tonight, Lord, as Christians, because we know that one day sin will be punished. But Lord, we pray for those that are sinners in our meeting tonight 
that they will accept the work on Calvary so that they won't have to be punished for their own sin. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. And as our children and young people head off to school again tomorrow and back into another term, Father, we pray for your hand upon them. We pray that you'll put your loving arms around them. We pray that you'll bless them and keep them safe. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.